Welcome back. It's uh, a great pleasure to chair our second keynote lecture. Um, we are honored that Professor Tarun Ramadurai has agreed to deliver this keynote. Tarun earned his PhD in economics at Harvard and uh, is currently at Imperial College, where he's a professor of financial economics. And he's also the executive director of the Review Financial Studies. Uh, previously, he was a professor at the Said uh, Business School at Oxford, where he also started his academic career. Um, Tarun is a leading expert in household finance. In his research, he has investigated the functioning of key household markets, including mortgages, real estate, and equity markets. Tarun's research has provided insights on fundamental issues for society, such as establishing a link between the design of a financial system and household inequality. Uh, let me briefly mention three key insights from Turin's work. First, Turin has examined how suboptimal household decisions can contribute to differences in wealth accumulation between the rich and the poor. Uh, second, he has provided insights about the precise specification of household preferences uh, from the financial decisions that they make. And more recently, he has shown how the use of machine learning can contribute to increasing disparities in household credit markets. So today's lecture um, is entitled Reference Dependence in the Housing Market, Preferences and Beliefs, and it focuses on a behavioral friction in housing markets known as nominal anchoring that can have broader macroeconomic implications. And I look forward to learning more about Tarun's insights into this exciting topic and the discussion that follows. And I know that many of you, many of you may be quite tired on the checking uh, flight schedules and the like. Uh, so Tarun has, uh, but I, I promise you, this is going to be a fascinating talk. And um, if anything, there's one killer chart. So I'll leave it for you to determine which one that is. That's all you need to take away from the talk. Uh, I understand you will be talking for about 40 minutes, and then I have the pleasure of running the Q&A. And now the floor is yours, and I will go sit down there. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for asking me to do this, uh, this keynote. Uh, I've enjoyed spending the last couple of days hearing uh, about all the interesting work that's happening in this area. Um, uh, I have to confess uh, to being a relative newcomer to expectation surveys, but the end of this talk will uh, hopefully give us uh, some reasons to, uh, to sort of connect the work that I'm doing with, uh, with expectation surveys as well. Um, I realize that I'm all that stands between you and drinks, so uh, let me see if I can um, uh, convince you that it's worth, uh, it's worth the extra wait. So I've been studying housing for some time, um, and housing markets are, are really important uh, to public policy debates around the world. Uh, there's, there's building evidence, um, some of it uh, my own. I happen to be in the et al. in the last two papers. This is the disadvantage of having a last name that begins with the letter R. Um, and so there's substantial evidence that um, there are behavioral frictions in the way that households think about uh, housing markets. In particular, they become very, very attached to, um, to particular numbers. And, and the number that they are uh, very often focused on is the, is the nominal price that they paid for their house. That sort of seems to be an object that's very, very uh, uh, top of mind for them. And, and, and that is going to come up again and again in this talk. Uh, now, uh, th the purpose of this talk is to say that it has um, broader macroeconomic consequences that they, that they do that. Because it turns out that if you see this kind of anchoring and it's widespread, it can really start to change the effects of both monetary and fiscal policy in the economy. And I'm going to try and show you that um, uh, in this case, but uh, with, with optimal fiscal policy in particular. Uh, but in terms of uh, the fact that we're in the ECB and this is a monetary authority, one of the things that I want you to keep in your mind is that it turns out that if people are attached to a nominal anchor in the past and care about the gains they've made relative to that nominal anchor, then actually inflation can actually help uh, the housing market. It can grease the wheels of the housing market. So if you have a burst of inflation, what it can actually do is to stimulate real activity in the market as agents come off with their nominal anchors. And that, that's going to become important too. Uh, now, uh, at the, at the, towards the end of this talk, uh, the question that I'm going to ask is sort of an age-old question in economics, which is, 
you know, is it preferences or is it beliefs? Uh, and it turns out this is a hard question everywhere, um, but they have different implications for the conduct of policy. And, and we're going to try and see whether we can try to do a little bit of unpacking. We're obviously not going to get to this is a little bit of the holy grail in behavioral economics, but we're going to see what we can do here. Uh, and household surveys become quite important in that context. So um, uh, let me sort of start with uh, telling you about something that we came up with in our paper uh, that's in the AER in 2022 using Danish data. And so this has you know, several million transactions in the Danish housing market, uh, but then uh, the sample is about a quarter of a million transactions. And so we have high quality administrative data on Danish housing listings, transactions on the housing stock, uh, matched with mortgages, uh, demographic and financial information about house sellers. I really love Scandinavia, as should you all, uh, for its extremely rich micro evidence. But then what we've done in this paper is to, to look at administrative housing market data from the United Kingdom. So we've amassed data from the land registry, the Bank of England. Uh, and I should add the usual disclaimer here that whatever I'm saying has nothing to do with the Bank of England. Um, but also uh, from Rightmove, uh, which is the largest uh, home listings company in the United Kingdom. So uh, rather than sort of talk you through this, let me just show you this picture. So this is kind of an interesting picture. Uh, this is model free in the sense that it's, uh, all it's doing is, uh, if, you, if you look at the x-axis of this plot, it's just taking for all of the transactions in Denmark that occurred um, over a 25 year period, it just says, uh, zero is people who sold their houses for exactly the, the purchase price of the house, okay? So these are people who made zero nominal gains on the property. There's no adjustment for inflation. There's nothing else really going on here. Uh, to the right here is people who made 10% nominal gains, 20% nominal gains, 30%, 40%. And then on the left-hand side is 10% nominal loss, 20% nominal loss, 30%, and so on and so forth. And all that I'm doing on the y-axis is I'm just plotting a frequency distribution of these transactions. This is what in public finance would, you would call a bunching distribution. Um, now, I hope you can see sort of two things in this little electrocardiogram that I'm showing you over here, which is basically um, people seem to have this uh, enormous excess propensity to sell the house for at least exactly what they purchased it for. There's some evidence of what we would call a notch in preferences, which is a reluctance to sell it for even just 1% below what they bought it for. And if I look at this counterfactual distribution, which is what would have happened if households had sold their houses for precisely the fair value of the house as estimated by a very rich hedonic model, which is a smooth distribution, then you can see that there's missing mass on the left, which has been shifted over to the right. So this is really quite striking. Um, and uh, you know, this is, uh, we saw this picture and, and we were sort of pretty, pretty amazed by it. This was the first time uh, this had been seen uh, in, in the housing market. And it does suggest very strong evidence that there's, some, there's nominal anchoring that's going on in this market. Now, two years after the publication of this paper, um, we decided we were gonna go to the UK and sort of see whether we can do something. And Den Denmark's quite a, quite a small housing market, so you can't do macro stuff. Um, uh, the UK is a market that has 10 times the number of, uh, uh, of house, housing units and about six times the surface area. So we thought we could do more with regional variation. So what we did is we got the data from the UK, which is publicly available from the land registry. And this is now 11 million transactions. And then if you sort of start merging it, then you get about three and a half million uh, transactions where you can see both the nominal purchase price and the sale price. And so we said, look, you know, can we just produce exactly the same plot? I have no idea what we're going to find there. And this is what we found in the UK. And, and so we thought this was really striking. I mean, it's basically exactly the same thing. If anything, the excess mass is even greater in the United Kingdom uh, as a percentage of the total distribution. Uh, you can see that there's a, a big, there's still the exact notch that you've got. You've got this uh, uh, clear evidence of a kink in preferences here as well. And then there's, there's lots of movement from, uh, from the left to the right. And there's lots of reasons why you can think about that as well. Uh, so there's diffuse mass, there's sharp excess mass, uh, you know, all, all the things that you might, might be interested in to look at. Okay. Now, you know, people have asked all kinds of questions about holding periods. What happens if, you know, you extend this out for three years, five years, 12 years? The answer is it just keeps going. I mean, it just doesn't stop. Uh, you still nominally anchor at precisely the purchase price with no adjustment for inflation. And while the extent of excess mass changes, the shape of the plot looks very similar even for 12-year holding periods, uh, which, is, which is pretty fascinating. Okay, so this is kind of where we start. And now we sort of want to go further with, uh, with, more, with more evidence. 
Um, so, you know, we adopt a very standard specification of behavioral preferences in our paper in Denmark, and I'm just going to sort of revise uh, a little bit what we do there and then take you into what we're doing uh, in terms of the, the macro here. So this is an extremely standard formulation. Imagine that you have a, a, a final sales price of the house. Uh, uh, you know, here's the input, which is you pick an object, which is the listing price of the house, and then the final sale price is the outcome of some negotiation between buyer and seller after you set the final uh, the, the listing price of the house. And so you might derive utility just from whatever that amount is. If you sell it for a high amount, you get high utility, and for a lower amount, you get lower utility. Uh, we usually set this up in log terms so that there's some curvature to the utility function. But the second piece of this is what about the gains and losses relative to a nominal reference point, which in our case is just simply the purchase price of the house whenever you purchased it. And so um, the specification of preferences is maybe you get some addition eta from those gains when the gain is positive, and maybe you get some decrement to utility lambda eta uh, when there's a, uh, uh, you, you go into the negative domain and you make a loss, and this is this piecewise linear utility function with a kink at the reference point. Um, obviously, uh, to explain the notch, you also need a discontinuity precisely at zero, and we can sort of get into that uh, a little bit later. Um, now, uh, there's lots of different controls that you need. You need uh, the mortgage balance. Uh, why do you need that? Because you could also be very averse to downsizing in a market in which there's uh, leverage constraints. So if house prices fall and the leverage constraint is an 80% LTV ratio, you might have to engage in very costly downsizing if there's even small price uh, uh, declines. So there's also potentially downsizing aversion that you need to control for before you can conclude that this is uh, actually evidence of loss aversion if people are, um, are selling there. And, then, and there's plenty of work that you can do on that, which we do in that paper. We also have to control for anticipated demand conditions, bargaining frictions, and so on. Uh, but when we do, uh, you can actually see that uh, two things. This is uh, the model implied equivalent of what you would see in terms of the realized gains distribution uh, in a market where agents are uh, nominally loss averse of the type that I've talked about with this piecewise linear utility function. Uh, if you had uh, basically no reference dependence at all and you only cared about the final sales price of the house, you'd have a smooth distribution that looks like this. In a world in which you do care about gains and losses, but you care about them symmetrically, uh, you might shift that distribution to the right and get the excess mass. But the only force that can really give you this, this big spike, uh, precisely at the nominal reference point, uh, is loss aversion. When I compare people, um, ideally what I'm doing is I'm basically comparing two people who sold the house for exactly the same price, but then had different reference prices coming into that transaction. <laughs> Now, this is an ex-ante object, which is what is the shape of the listing premium by potential gains? That is to say, uh, if I have a certain level of paper gains on my property uh, and I'm listing it on the market, uh, what does my markup uh, look like when I set it up uh, on the market? And the answer is it's going to be a very strong, uh, strongly uh, evident function of the extent of those paper gains that I'm making. Uh, if I'm in a territory here where I'm making high paper gains, uh, if I were to sell it, um, at the hedonic value relative to the reference point, the nominal purchase price that I bought it for, then I don't set a big markup on the, of the house over and above the fair value of the house. But as soon as I move into lost territory, I start marking up my house a lot. Why? Because I want to offset those nominal losses I'm making by essentially making gains on the property. Now, of course, the, the trade-off here is I might eventually get that higher price, but I'm going to have to wait a really long time until someone turns up uh, either because there's inflation in the marketplace that actually gets me my nominal reference point uh, and above my nominal reference point, or because someone turns up who really, really loves the house. Okay, so that, that, those are the two forces. Now, you can already start to see some interesting uh, thoughts here, which is that if I'm really, really attached to that price, I'm prepared to wait for a long time. This is essentially saying my nominal anchor is creating real consequences what are those real consequences? The housing market volumes are basically going to collapse in a world in which lots of agents are nominally loss averse. Okay. Uh, now, of course, if you structurally estimate, which we do in that paper, uh, the, uh, here the black is the model and, the, and the, the pink is the data. And it turns out that you can actually fit this very nicely with a model in which you have these uh, piecewise linear kink preferences. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about these macro consequences. Uh, so. Uh, first thing I want to show you here is that if you divide up the United Kingdom and take that bunching plot that I showed you and just disaggregate it by region, 
Uh, you can see that there's evidence that this is basically in all regions of the country. It does vary, of course. So in London, which has experienced high rates of price appreciation, you still see this evidence of nominal anchoring, but the entire distribution of realized gains has been shifted to the right, of course, by the fact that house price inflation has been high in London. But if you go to areas which are relatively more impoverished in the United Kingdom, like the northeast of the country, you start to see that precisely, uh, you know, this is, there's much more mass to the left of this distribution, and many more people are having to sell at realized losses. The thing that you might worry about more as a state variable, or you know, we endogenize it, so it's not really a state variable, I'll tell you more about this in a, in a little while, is the extent to which people are facing paper gains on their houses, okay, uh, or paper losses. And this is what that distribution looks like across the country. So this is the distribution of uh, the as-if paper gains. So suppose I just took a hedonic model, like the Zillow model in the US, or the you know, I just go and get an automated home valuation as soon as I list my property, or even just look up my property and say, can you give me a price for it? That's the equivalent of the hedonic model. That's saying, if I look at all the properties that were ever listed in London, you know, what was the, the gain that they could have sold it at had that fair value estimate been the price at which they sold it? The answer would be, you know, there's just a huge fraction here uh, close to about 87% uh, of the data that's sitting on gains territory over the entire sample period, uh, and about 13% of, uh, of the properties would have sold at a loss had they sold at fair value. Uh, here in the Northeast, that number is 40% of the people would have sold at a paper loss. So it's, you know, as you can see, there's massive regional variation. There's also going to be time variation in this statistic, and what we're saying is this statistic, which is what's the fraction of paper losses in the housing market, is something we should all keep track of as macroprudential, even in a macroprudential setting. We should think about it for optimal housing taxation. We should think about it uh, from the perspective of monetary policy and how it affects the housing market. It's a simple, easily computed statistic. And if you can just do that, all you need is, what was the price that someone paid for their house initially? That's their nominal reference point. What's the hedonic value of the house today? Now I can just calculate whether you're in gain territory or in loss territory, and I can tell you the fraction of people that are sitting in that in, in either the gain domain or the loss domain. That's, that's all that I'm saying here. Now this is basically, uh, if you remember, I showed you on the left-hand side in the theory what the markup looks like as a function of the nominal gains. These are the actual markups that people set, and you can see that it looks exactly like the model predicts, which is that people who are sitting in uh, nominal gain territory have low markups on their property, and people who are sitting in nominal loss territory are marking up their properties extremely high relative to our fair value estimate of the property. So they're setting these properties on the market at extremely unrealistic values. This is actually the force that generates all of the real consequences, because the more unrealistic your price, the less likely it's going to get taken off the market. Volumes crash in this market, and then that's the uh, mechanism that's, that's operational here. Okay, so at the individual micro level, uh, sellers are unwilling to realize a loss. They're prepared to tolerate higher times on the market, and so you have lower selling probabilities for these houses. At the aggregate macro level, if there's a price relevant shock or a policy intervention, then actually prices are gonna react very sluggishly in this market, so there's a nominal rigidity because people are unwilling to adjust their prices, unwilling to accept the nominal loss. Volumes are actually going to absorb variation that would otherwise show up in prices, so there are real consequences associated with this nominal rigidity. People just don't move. People turn down labor market opportunities. People basically do silly things to avoid uh, realizing a loss uh, on their properties. And so this is what we call behavioral lock-in. Okay? So in some regions, people are behaviorally locked in uh, because they're unwilling to realize the loss, and so they're turning, out, turning down all of these sorts of opportunities. Now, is that really showing up in the data? I mean, is it the case that uh, places where people are sitting on high paper losses uh, have a different relationship between prices and volumes? The answer is yes. Um, so this is sort of where uh, we bring some new macro facts to the table in this paper. This is US data, just to give you a sense, uh, and then this is the UK data. Um, in the US data, this is a commonly known fact. This is price changes on the x-axis and volumes on the y-axis. We're just subtracting off uh, location-specific means just to give you a sense of the variation in the data. And you can see that, for example, when there's an 8% price increase that is accompanied by about a 20% uh, volume increase uh, in, 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 at, at times at which that happens, that's what happens. But then here's really the, the interesting part, which is the slope is very different on the, on the downside. So when there's an 8% volume decline, 
there's almost a 30% uh, price decline in the U.S. So basically what's happening is uh, there's already some asymmetry in the response uh, between uh, times when the market's going up and times when the market's going down. Uh, people have known this for some time. They call this the sort of price volume asymmetry in these markets. What's new about what we're saying here is look at the places that have a low share of paper losses versus the places that have a high share of paper losses. That asymmetry is substantially more pronounced in places where people have a very high share of paper losses. So you can see that, in fact, the volume response to an 8% price decline is, is enormous uh, in places. So there's, there's regional variation, there's time variation. This is something we should really be thinking about as far as the health of the housing market is concerned. Now, you can turn this, uh, this little uh, sort of you know, comparison between low loss share and high loss share areas into something that's just a correlation coefficient or a co-movement between prices and volumes. You can do that for each region of the UK. You can plot that co-movement coefficient on the y-axis and then plot what the paper losses are like on the x-axis. And when you do that, you actually see the, the nice linear relationship. You can confirm that in regressions. You can control for uh, the different prevalence of mortgages in these places. You can do whatever you want, but this relationship is extremely robust. In fact, the fraction of owners with potential losses actually is helpful at predicting volume movements to an even greater extent than just price changes on their own, okay? So if you were to just pick one variable, this is the one that you should be picking, and, and that's the lesson that we have. Of course, the interactive effects really give you a lot of information as well. Now, lest you worry that this is about the fact that maybe these people are sort of trapped by their mortgages, you can actually do this in a sample of properties that people have no mortgages, they're completely mortgage-free. The relationship does attenuate, but it's still very much there in the data. Um, that's fine because, you know, in the model as well, there's a role for down payment constraints, so both of those things are actually operating at the same time. But it's still the case that there's this sort of behavioral lock-in effect that uh, you're seeing in the data. Okay. Now, uh, you know, to, to sort of really rationalize all of these patterns and to sort of start uh, going a little bit further down the path um, and, and to start thinking about optimal housing market uh, tax policy and monetary policy, you need to set up a model which sort of matches the patterns in the data. Uh, the model that I showed you earlier was a sort of simple partial equilibrium setup in which sellers are just responding to their own behavioral preferences. But to really do this right, you want a forward-looking bunch of buyers, you want sellers, you want something that's dynamic, you want something that you can really sort of start calibrating in a, in a macro sense, so that's what we build. I'm not going to, uh, at, uh, you know, on the second day of the conference after you've been hit with repeated uh, papers, uh, you know, drag you through the details of the model. It's, it's a fairly complicated model. But let me just sort of tell you the prim principal features of this model and then try and explain some of the intuition for what's going on. So we set this up in a very kind of rich fashion. The seller's problem is this is a dynamically optimizing homeowner who has a reference price R. Now, perhaps the most impressive technical contribution of this paper for which all of my co-authors on the front page are sort of uh, you know, responsible, so I'm, I'm sort of very, uh, you know, I should have, you probably saw that there's a, a long cast of characters, um, some of whom are, are on the job market. Johanna Siliander's on the job market this year, and he's, he's very, very good. He's a postdoc of mine. Um, but what we've done here is these reference prices are actually endogenous in this model. So every time there's a transaction in this model, the, in, the, the, the buyer of the property inherits that purchase price as their reference point, and then that they take that forward with them. So we endogenize that distribution of potential gains uh, in the economy. I'll tell, I'll tell you more about that in a second. But imagine that there's someone who just, you know, a, a seller who, who, who has this reference point that they've brought in with them. They also have a mortgage M. They draw a moving opportunity shock. They decide whether or not to list the property. So there's an extensive margin decision in the model as well, and then they set the asking price, which is the list price for their property in each period. Uh, upon a sale, it's a realization utility model. The utility has two components. Uh, you get uh, uh, gains and losses add to your final sale utility, but also there's loss aversion, which is that losses hurt you more than gains by you. Uh, there's also a financial constraint, uh, and the tightness of your down payment constraint depends on your current home equity position, which again, we allow to evolve uh, in the setup. Buyers are no longer a sideshow in this model. They're forward-looking. They search for properties uh, upon, uh, and then there's a match rate, which is endogenous uh, in, this, in this model. So as more and more sellers decide to list, 
the market becomes less and less tight. As the market becomes less and less tight, the frequency with which buyers and sellers bump into each other increases. All of this is endogenous and accounted for uh, in the models. So this is a, you know, a classic search and matching setup. Um, and so that aggregate matching function is something we estimate using actual search data, billions of observations of people looking at properties because we have access to that data in the UK. So we actually can see when people are searching for properties. And so we have a paper on the matching function, uh, which is this other paper over here. Again, I, I'm, I'm in the et al. If there's one piece of advice I can offer young researchers, change your name to AAA, whatever your last name is. Okay. Uh, upon a meeting, uh, what happens to buyers is that they draw a taste shock and they optimally choose whether to accept the offer. So the way that transactions happen, because there's a willingness to pay, willingness to accept gap in the model, because obviously sellers have this nominal uh, uh, sort of loss aversion and reference dependence, so they mark up the property well beyond what its fair value is. And buyers, in order to surmount that gap, really have to love the property. So they have to draw a taste shock that is sufficiently high for them to actually take the property on. The reason that the housing market becomes endogenously more sluggish is because as there are more sellers in the market who have these loss aversion issues, the willingness to pay, willingness to accept gap gets bigger and bigger. And you're just waiting for these people to turn up uh, who, have, who really love these houses. So the match has got to be just perfect uh, between buyer and seller. OK, so the equilibrium here has a consistency between expectations, actions, and matching outcomes. So everything is really endogenous. And we have an endogenous distribution of these reference prices and mortgage amounts. There's some interesting features to the model, like behavioral rationalism, where a buyer realizes that if they pay a very high price for a house, they realize they're going to carry that forward with them as their reference point in the future. And then they endogenously scale back, as a result, the amount that they're prepared to pay for the house. So there's, there's some interesting features to this model as well from a purely theoretical perspective. So we then structurally estimate this model. Uh, we match the steady state of the model um, to uh, the micro empirical moments. We don't touch the macro moments when we do that. Uh, and so these are basically like the bunching distribution that you saw. Uh, the listing premium uh, increase, the hockey stick with respect to, in the markup with respect to the potential gains that you face, uh, and also what the, um, uh, the, the price is that you get when you put a listing premium of a particular size up on the market, as well as what the uh, conditional probability of sale is for properties that have extremely high listing premia. So if a property is marked up 60%, then you know, what's the likelihood that it's going to sell very quickly? Extremely low but we need to target that uh, as well as a moment in our estimation. So we estimate these uh, structural parameters uh, of the model. We get reference dependence of about 0.5 and loss aversion in the dynamic model of about 3.46. Uh, in our Danish paper, we got 2.5, which was bang on the Kahneman and Tversky estimate, of the, which is that losses are disliked 2.5 times as much as gains are liked. This is a, a common statistic. Here we get about three and a half times more. So you dislike losses about three and a half times more. 0.5 essentially means for every $1 you get in final sale, you value the gain loss component of, of that about a half. OK, about 50% uh, is coming from the gain loss component of your utility. Uh, we then uh, generate model implied untargeted aggregate moments. And then we're able to match this price volume co-movement. We're able to match the variation in the price volume co-movement with the share of paper losses uh, in the setup. Now, why is all of this useful? It's useful because once we've got a calibrated model, we can actually start doing the things that we really wanted to do in the first place, which is to think about optimal policy. So you know, here we are in the ECB. You know, you're thinking about optimal monetary policy all the time. You know, our model is able to tell us how the frictionless economy uh, differs from the, uh, from the behavioral economy. Uh, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the fiscal market consequences of this, because in the first paper and the one that we have, we tell you about what optimal transactions taxes should look like in a behavioral economy where people really care about nominal loss aversion. And we also tell you about ongoing property taxes and how that should change. So we do some optimal tax calculations in our setup. So the two types of fiscal policy that we think about are a transactions tax, which is very common in, in housing markets, which is like a stamp duty in the UK. And the other one is an ongoing property tax, which is like a percentage of the house value uh, that you have to give away uh, every period to the fiscal authority. This is what's called a council tax in the United Kingdom. So behavioral frictions turns out to affect the shape of the Laffer curve for ongoing property taxes. And let me provide you a little bit of intuition for this, which is, first of all, prices are on average higher. Because imagine a world in which you introduce 
uh, a behavioral uh, seller into an otherwise rational economy. This behavioral seller cares about the gain loss component of their utility in addition to the final sale price. So in that sense, the price kind of almost counts twice for them, once because it counts for the final price, once because it counts relative to the amount that you're making in terms of nominal gains relative to your reference point. And so prices are on average higher in the equilibrium of this model. Because prices are on average higher, all these taxes are gonna collect more revenue, uh, okay? So in that sense, the Laffer curve uh, is sort of, you know, you're getting more, you're getting a higher bang for your buck. It's also the case that prices are less sensitive to a tax change because the, the insight of this model is that prices basically have very little elasticity to shocks. All of the shocks are being absorbed by the real volumes that's actually happening in the economy. So, you know, you might be reassured by the fact that, you know, everybody keeps saying this, oh, housing markets never crash. Housing markets do crash. The crash is coming in volumes. It's not coming in prices. You're looking at the wrong thing uh, is the insight uh, of, of this particular model. Um, now, so we just do a bunch of calculations. We say, look, you know, the government authority or the fiscal authority in this case cares about tax revenue. This is the usual Laffer curve. But actually, you should also care about the total surplus of the agents in the economy. The total surplus is coming from the fact that even though you may be very happy with the fact that you've made nominal gains or losses, you've incurred real consequences by turning down profitable opportunities to move, labor market moves that you could have made. Uh, maybe there's also these taste shocks that uh, buyers need to have. You're sort of restricting the distribution to being people who have really fantastically high taste shocks in order to get into this market. So we need to think about total surplus of buyers and sellers as well when we're doing these optimal tax calculations. Okay, so um, two quick things I'll say about this. In terms of the transactions tax, uh, it turns out that um, you know, even in a frictionless model, property, property values and transactions volumes do decrease. But in the behavioral model, you do get higher tax revenue, but the surplus is much lower than in the frictionless model. Uh, and this is because of the behavioral lock-in, because prices remain high, but all of the consequences are in volumes. If anything, this is saying that the usual intuition that transactions taxes are bad for the housing market is even worse in a market populated by behavioral agents who are already too sluggish and are already not moving very much. Those effects are much worse. Ongoing property tax, the intuition is again very straightforward. Here, everything just happens in prices in the frictionless model. Transactions volumes are unaffected. There are no real consequences. This is why we love lump sum taxation uh, as economists. Actually, it turns out that in the behavioral model, the same thing holds true because reference prices are endogenous. So when prices move down, reference prices move down by exactly the same amount as well. So the same intuition that property taxes are very good continues to hold true. But with the added benefit that because prices are uh, very inelastic in this economy, you can go further with optimal property taxation and just collect more revenue from agents because of the fact that they, they don't really care that much. Prices are basically going to stay high. They're just getting their gains and losses utility. So that's really the, the offset for them. So if you sort of put that together with property taxes and the frictionless model, this is the total curve, okay? This is like a Laffer curve plus the surplus of the agents for different weights on what you think that surplus of the agents should look like. So W equals 15 puts a very high weight on, this, on the surplus of the agents. W equals 75 puts a very low weight on the surplus of the agents relative to the government tax revenue calculation that they're making. But actually the optimal council tax or the property tax rate in this economy is actually fairly low. It's between one and 2% uh, in our calibrated setup. In the behavioral economy, you're actually able to go further. You're able to go much closer to 2% because of this inelasticity of prices um, uh, to, to the council tax. Okay. Okay. So um, this is all sort of what we've done. These are the aggregate consequences of reference dependence in a market in which we have modeled these things as being coming from preferences. But for the last two days, we've been talking about expectations. We've been talking about beliefs. So, you know, maybe I'll use the last uh, eight or 10 minutes to tell you a little bit about how we, we, we're thinking about distinguishing these things from each other. So bunching patterns in the data that we've just shown you, that this was the first picture, um, uh, could also arise from non-rational beliefs uh, by households about the value of their houses, okay? So um, now let me try and sort of explain. In, in a simple version of the model with reference dependent uh, preferences that we solved, the seller has a choice between the utility realized from a successful, uh, from a successful sale and not selling, uh, and then they get an outside option utility in that model. In that model and in the structural estimation, we assume that that outside option utility is just the pure hedonic value of the house, okay? So you basically know exactly what the fair value of the house is. 
And you know, in that model, you make the comparisons between the value, that, the price that you can get for the house if you sold it versus the utility of the outside option, utility of the, the price that you can get if you sell it. But there, even though you know that these two things um, you know, have a particular fair value, you also know that you get utility from nominal gains. Okay, and so it's preferences that are making you do the markup. It's because you're just happy uh, that you've sold it for more because you've got this second component to your utility function. Now, the alternative is that the seller could value the outside option using the reference price. That is to say, the seller might falsely believe that their current house value is, a, is actually whatever they paid for it, okay? It, it may be that they're just you know, oblivious to the fact that there's this hedonic value, there's a fair value estimate, there's appreciation on the house price and so on. Maybe they actually just think, hey, what's really going on here is I paid uh, $100,000 for the house, the house is worth $100,000. Okay, or at least $100,000, and I'm not prepared to let the price fall one uh, iota below that because it's not a fair deal. Okay, so that's the, the, the belief-based explanation. The preference-based explanation is that they objectively weight the hedonic price against what they would get from gain losses. Okay, so we've seen a bunch of work uh, about this on the strength of behavioral channels um, uh, by looking at the responses of households to questions and expectation surveys, and we can do exactly that, okay? So we go to the US Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances. We look at 42,000 households from 2001 to 2022. There's data on the initial purchase price of the primary residence of the households. This is the question of, you know, how much did you pay for the house? And then the perceived value of the residence in the survey year, how much would you get for the house if you sold it today? Okay, that's the question. Same thing in the ECB Household Finance and Consumption uh, Survey. I'll tell you a little bit about the counterfactuals in a second. So the first thing you might wanna ask is, if I just take the difference between the perceived value and the initial purchase price and I did the same bunching diagrams, what would I find in these household surveys? Okay, and the answer is I find exactly the same thing. All right, so this is fascinating. I mean, this thing is showing up over and over and over again. Okay, again, this is zero. The percentage returns are 20%, 40%, and so on. This is minus 20, minus 40. This is just a frequency distribution. This is from the US, this is from Europe. And when you do this, you see this enormous amount of bunching precisely at zero. People are basically telling you that their house today is worth exactly what they paid for it. That shows up again with holding periods that go up to five, seven years. It doesn't really seem to change things very much. So the, the, clearly something is going on here um, that sort of is telling us that we need to look uh, a little bit deeper into this. Now, of course, it could be the case that maybe housing returns uh, for all of the people who were surveyed was exactly zero in both the US data and the European data. So just like in the other study, we need to have a counterfactual distribution to tell us a little bit about this. So we compute that counterfactual by just looking at state level returns. You know the state of the place, you know the time. So you basically just take an index of how much house prices have appreciated in that particular state uh, over the holding period uh, up until the date at which the survey occurs. And then when you do that, you still see excess mass. This is the excess mass distribution. If I subtract off the counterfactual distribution from the actually reported distribution, I still see evidence of this notch here. I st still see evidence over here uh, of this. This is in the US. Uh, in the, in the uh, Euro HHF data, uh, we actually look at, um, this is just for the Netherlands because that's where we had a good housing index. Again, it's much more noisy because the observations are lower, but you can still see this distinct, uh, these distinct patterns in the excess mass distribution. So, so clearly something, something, is, something is going on here. Okay, so we sort of tried to take this a little bit further, and here uh, Demetrius and, uh, and Jeff were very helpful, uh, and this is sort of something that we've been looking at. We're looking at this in the ECB Consumer Expectations Survey. The slight complication in this survey is that you have these, um, so these, uh, these bins in which you ask for the price rather than asking for the exact price. But even so, I mean, one method is to do the extreme method where what you do is you just pick a randomly selected value uh, with one euro increments inside the bin for both the, the question that was asked about how much your house uh, was, how much did you pay for your house and how much you, um, uh, you, you could sell your house for, different seeds. Um, and so if I, if I do that, you know, there's still sort of a pileup of mass over here. We'd have to control uh, for the counterfactual to really see whether uh, this is shifted uh, to the left relative to the counterfactual distribution, but I, I suspect it might be. Nevertheless, you could also do something where you assume that, you know, you take the midpoint of the range, and if they basically select exactly the same range in both cases, 
then you're going to get a pileup of mass over here. And if you do that, so this is arguably saying, you know, we're tying our hands against finding anything. And this is we are tying our hands in favor of finding everything. And you're sort of, you know, the truth is probably somewhere in between uh, those two numbers. But that's, that's where we are with that. So, um, you know, I've got about two and a half minutes left, but maybe I should conclude and then we can open it up for questions which is, um, you know, we've found this widespread evidence for nominal anchoring and loss aversion using these uh, interesting patterns, which is sort of showing you bunching. Uh, it's identification at the individual level using very, very large administrative data sets of precisely what people bought and sold their houses for. This is publicly available, and we've now validate the, validated this in multiple countries. Uh, um, uh, some of my co-authors uh, who have done some work on the U.S., uh, have tried to do the same thing um, uh, following some conversations with the U.S. and it, and it holds there as well. Um, this is, uh, you know, we sort of endogenize the statistic, but we think it's a new, useful, sufficient statistic to quantify aggregate macro impacts, which is what is the fraction of homeowners that are sitting on uh, potential paper losses uh, at any given point in time. We think policymakers should pay attention to that statistic. We then have this sort of dynamic search and matching model of the, uh, of the housing market, uh, and that's basically telling us uh, so far our fiscal policy implications for this, uh, and it turns out this loss share is an important determinant of the tax policy impacts, uh, and then we, we're seeing some evidence that maybe we should care about these things both for transactions taxes as well as ongoing property taxes, and then there's this sort of uh, intriguing evidence towards the end that maybe we should be thinking about preferences and beliefs um, and, and so maybe if some component of this is beliefs, maybe an inf information intervention uh, will matter. But I think for this audience that cares about expectation surveys, I hope what I put on the table is we, we are generally asking people what they think about the future. And I guess what we're saying in this paper is you should also figure out where they were in the past, okay? So if you really want to get a, a complete picture of what's going on, not just think about questions about the future, but also assess the current circumstances of these people. It turns out that that has uh, potentially a lot of information that can be helpful. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, so wonderful. Thanks, Tarun. Fascinating talk. So um, let's take a couple of questions. Um, you can just raise your hand. Okay, we start in the back. You could, uh, Philip you could just introduce yourself. And Great. Uh, Philip Schirmer of Bonn. So I find it super fascinating, and thanks for the interesting research agenda. Um, I was thinking the other way around. So not the, so if, if inflation is high, but this is really a nominal um, reference point, either in belief or in preferences, would you think that then high inflationary periods kind of like loosen the housing market in the sense that more people move outside of the lost domain and vice versa? So that really makes it hard to disentangle effects of inflation and these behavioral effects, right? It would be interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, should, should I answer these questions? It's up to one you. By one? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't have a pen and a piece of paper. Uh, so I can I'm give you one, but uh, okay. just... Yeah, okay, maybe I'll just sort of go one by one if, that, yeah. if that's okay with everybody. Okay, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's our point, which is that inflation is stimulative for the housing market because it just pushes a bunch of agents uh, off their, um, uh, their nominal reference points and then pushes them into gains territory. Now, of course, these gains are entirely illusory because they're all nominal gains. Uh, but this is one of those cases in which inflation can actually grease the wheels um, of the housing market, so it's in some ways a sort of offsetting beneficial effect of inflation in, in that it generates uh, additional mobility. Um, uh, you know, so uh, it's interesting because in, in a frictionless model, okay, you would not get those effects, uh, I don't think. I mean, we'd have to work out the model and the optimal policy consequences, but, but I think you get, you get a little bit back um, from uh, inflationary uh, you know, monetary policy, essentially, is what this is saying. So can I have a follow-up question on this? Please, is, yeah. um, is it uh, Is it correct to interpret your results as some notion of money illusion? I mean, have you looked at sort of low, high inflation periods where their results differ in that direction? Yeah, um, so I, absolutely. The model would basically state that that's what it is. I mean, but it's it's money illusion coming from a very specific friction which is it's not as though people can't perceive the difference between real uh, and nominal. It's that um, people 
perceive everything. In fact, in our uh, housing uh, rational expectations model, it truly is a rational expectations model where agents are super well informed. They make very complicated, sophisticated calculations. It's just that they have preferences that are non-standard. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as though they're saying, look, I know, you know, this is who I am. I understand all this stuff you're telling me about real and the nominal, but I just can't get this number out of my head and I need to do some stuff here. So in that sense, it's not quite money illusion, but uh, you know, I'm happy to let the illusion uh, fool me in the sense that I'm getting some gains rather than I'm sitting in the lost domain. Now, this is why the beliefs preferences thing becomes so important because if it turns out that it's, it's not uh, uh, preferences, then actually an inter information intervention can do a lot of good. Um, and, and I think that would be an interesting experiment for us to do. Okay then. If you can add. So uh, I have a very morbid question to ask, so, so I have to ask this. But thinking about identification, yeah. what do you think about using um, unexpected deaths and estate sales to disentangle preferences versus beliefs? Um, okay, so, so this is not at all a morbid question because you probably uh, are aware, you may or may not be aware that the Anderson on the Danish paper is Stefan Anderson at Copenhagen Business School. Uh, Stefan has even more morbidly uh, with Casper Nielsen, who is also a co-author on another paper we have on the Danish mortgage market, the guy who, one of the guys who pioneered the sudden death identification technique uh, in, in Denmark. They have a series of papers about this. Um, now, uh, presumably the idea that you have is, uh, if you've inherited the house, you have no reference point associated with it um, because of the fact that you, know, you didn't pay that purchase price. Uh, but I think it would be difficult to disentangle that explanation from one in which you erase the mistaken beliefs of the people who uh, had the house and you inherited fr it from them. So in that sense, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's generically hard to separate preferences from beliefs. And so you could always tell a story where if you found a particular result that you could say it was either preferences uh, or from beliefs. This is why the information intervention uh, we find interesting because you can just define beliefs as things that can be changed and preferences as things that are immutable. And if you do that, that becomes uh, a little bit of an easier way uh, to get around this conundrum, which I think is just a hard conundrum uh, to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question here in the front. Um, hi. Giorgio Toppa, New York Fed. Um, so I had uh, one quick question about the model and then a more sort of general comment. Um, in the model, are, are the buyers all first time buyers or do you allow them to uh, sell and buy at the same time? You know, if, I am a, if I'm upgrading, uh, I wanna sell my current home and, and, and does that make a difference for the results? And then the second point, you know, you've been, you talked at the end about um, you know, information interventions that could stimulate the, the housing market. And I was wondering, you know, from a welfare point of view, like wh where is the, what is the sort of market failure or, or externality that you're trying to address? And is it just this sort of behavioral feature? But then if that's part of my preferences, you know, yeah, so just wanted you to Great. comment on that. So, so uh, b both very, very helpful questions. So, so let me sort of start with the first one, uh, which is about um, uh, uh, what does the model look like? So it turns out that we do generically and, and, and in, full, in full generality in this model, uh, every time you sell a house, you then get the, you anticipate that what's gonna happen is in the event of a sale, you get the buyer's value function in the next period. And if you are a buyer, you get the homeowner's value function in the next period with the additional point that the purchase price that you pay is encoded as your reference point for all future transactions. So in that sense, it's sort of very rich and you do have these dynamics where people are moving around. The number of sellers in the model is endogenous because you can decide whether or not to put your home on the market. And then you endogenize the fact that when I do that, I'm gonna change the matching rate between agents and then maybe that is gonna affect the probabilities. In that sense, um, it's a little bit like Crusell and Smith in the sense that, um, uh, but, but, but different because Crusell and Smith, you, you assume that the aggregate distribution, you have no effect on the aggregate distribution when you're making your decisions. In our setup, you do assume, you internalize the externality of your decisions uh, in the aggregate. Um, now, uh, the thing that would be harder 
and, and, the, and the trick that, that allows us to do this fairly complicated bit is that we are assuming a one period delay. That is to say, okay, now, now that, that, that actually simplifies our lives a lot because if you can imagine that people are simultaneously thinking about both value functions, then the, mo the model becomes a real, I mean, it's already a bit of a bear to solve, but then it becomes a, a, you know, an Alaskan Kodiak bear with you know, sort of very large and very scary. So, so we, we haven't sort of gone there quite yet, but, but, but it, it is something that we've been thinking about. Uh, now, the second question that you had is about the information intervention and how we think about that. Uh, that's, that's, a really, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so w I completely agree with you. Preferences are preferences, and if that's what people's preferences are, that's what they are. And in this model, when we're thinking about optimal taxation, we're not assuming any manipulation is able to change that. The information intervention would tell us whether or not it was a fixed immutable preference of the household that we have to take as given in welfare calculations, or whether they're simply confused about what the value of their house is, and maybe they find value, house valuation a little bit tough, and maybe what they somehow think is, you know what, you know, I'm just gonna stick to my, my belief that it's worth at least this, or you know, this is what it's worth, and, and I'm not budging anymore. Um, this is, of course, especially a problem. It isn't so much a problem when prices have risen so far that you're all in gains territory. But it is a problem when you know, someone comes along to you and says, listen, buddy, I'm, I'm sorry to break the news to you, but your house is worth 10% less than, uh, than, than you purchased uh, it, it, it for. And, and so maybe they're just um, you know, sort of refusing to believe that. Now, of course, the thing that's, that's curious about this is that even though you wait around and you eventually get that 10%, it's all illusion, right? Because at the end of the day, either house price inflation has sort of pushed that price so that it's, you know, in real terms, there's no real difference, or you've foregone the opportunity cost of all of those wonderful opportunities you could have had by giving up your house, which could have been worth well more than 10%. But yeah, so. Next question here on the left. Damian Pfeiffer, Cleveland Tech. Um, I sort of have two questions. First one is uh, on the model a little bit in any specific and optimal policy. So if you try to maximize some welfare of these individuals and given the loss aversion of, uh, I could imagine a state dependent optimal policy, right? So that if you're in the loss territory, uh, it would be different than if you're in the gains territory. And if you can uh, talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Um, and the second one is, yeah, a lot of people here study inflation expectations and we all know that being a homeowner matters but uh, you know we didn't have uh, that detailed data and perhaps the, the, the where you are with respect to the reference point might matter more than, than being a homeowner so just speculating yeah so uh, the second one uh, I let me just sort of take those two uh, in, in reverse order the second uh, point that you make which is that uh, people uh, have looked at the status of being a homeowner versus a renter and there's been some work there uh, what we're saying here is maybe the status of being a homeowner matters and how much it matters depends a little bit on where you purchase the house price. Um, I would encourage uh, everyone to take that explanation, cite our paper in all of your inflation expectations papers where you do this because I completely believe that this is, this is at work in the data and then the work that I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping we can, we can accomplish will, will sort of start uh, getting a little bit deeper down that, uh, down that uh, particular line of thinking. The first point that you made is, is very interesting. And in fact, you don't even have to go as far as state contingent. You can even do something as simple as there's regional redistribution that's occurring. Why is that? Because the same tax policy or the same monetary policy in our model is gonna affect different regions of the country differently based on what the pre-existing loss shares are in those regions of the country. In particular, what you'll get is that the elasticity um, uh, that agents have both on the extensive margin as well as with prices uh, is going to differ in different regions of the country based on how much in the way of losses you're, you're, you're sitting on. Uh, so for example, the, you know, you can, you're, you're basically gonna raise much more off of raising council taxes, sadly, from the places that are suffering the worst losses because those people are just gonna keep prices very high, prices are not gonna adjust optimally, and the share of revenues you collect from depressed areas is gonna be greater than than in other areas. And so, so in that sense, what's happening here is, you know, basically what this model would suggest is you should be looking at this state of losses and then maybe even adjust, give people council tax rebates, think about what the optimal uh, transactions tax rebate should be in different areas of the country, 
uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so far, we've just solved for the optimal tax policy, but in a counterfactual, we could easily uh, think about doing that. And that's a great, uh, great, great point. Good. Mm. Yes. Chen Wang from uh, University of Notre Dame. I really, yeah, really enjoying this uh, this uh, fascinating line of research. So I have a uh, two questions. I was wondering, so basically uh, related to your holy grail question about uh, in behavioral finance, it's really just about the uh, beliefs or it's the uh, preferences. I was wondering what kind of a kind of a behavioral model or distortion in beliefs can really generate the effect we observe. So. You may have the reference point in this case maybe uh, your prior, but uh, in this case you really have to have a very very slow learning or some sort of a, maybe a very significant decreasing uh, gain learning so that we you never deviate so much from your your belief. So I was just wondering, do you have any thought on that? And uh, mm -hmm. if I may ask a second question, Please, this yeah. uh, related is. Uh, I think, in, especially in the U.S., uh, nowadays, if you go on Zillow, it's really easy to get uh, basically a Z estimate, which is uh, their estimate based on certain models of uh, the value of your house in real time. I found that just a, like a very, very casual observation that when people list their houses, usually the value is very close or even identical to that value. That means this is also likely to be a very uh, directly available uh, pr uh, reference point. I was wondering, is there a kind of a variation along these lines can be explored? You, you can trade people with, maybe remind them of their Zestimate, and uh, maybe they will not bunching at zero, but instead at the value that's provided by Zillow. Yep, um, great. Uh, so the answer to your first question, um, uh, or, or at least certainly my, my reaction to that first question, because I'm not sure, you know, we haven't quite done the work yet, so we, um, is you're right, you'd have to invoke something where people are just doggedly attached to their belief, they're sort of dogmatic about their belief that the price is worth, uh, you know, the house is worth exactly uh, what I paid for it. Now, you know, this sort of unwillingness to accept unpalatable information is a feature of some models in, in economics. We've sort of seen this, there's this agreement to disagree. I mean, we, there's a rich tradition of these kinds of models. Um, I think it becomes um, harder and harder to explain that behavior the further and further away you go from the uh, time that you purchased the house. So I would say that, you know, if I were to just speculate, and this is pure speculation at this stage, you know, short horizon attachment to the nominal anchor could be explained by beliefs, but I think long horizon attachment to the nominal anchor is far more difficult to invoke a model of beliefs to, to explain that. So I think at least, what I would say is I don't think any of the work that we've done on the preferences so far would would disappear. I, I think it's just a matter of parsing uh, at what horizon you can actually affect uh, any, any differences. Um, yeah, so, so th as far as bunching at the Zestimate or bunching at the hedonic value, we find no evidence that people are bunching at the hedonic value. I'll, I'll go even further, which is people have asked us lots of questions. What happens if you inflation adjust the reference point? Something even simpler, in the United Kingdom for certain categories, of, in fact, for most houses you pay the transactions tax, which I talked about uh, endogenizing here. That transactions tax, there's an escalator. It varies from four, about 2% to about 9% for the highest value houses. You might imagine that what you'd do is you'd gross that up with the purchase price because if the incidence is on the buyer initially, Anyway, we don't know where the incidence is because the price is going to reflect it and so on. So you might expect that you'll take whatever the purchase price of the house is, you'd gross it up by the transaction stacks, and maybe that becomes your reference point, okay? Now, when we plot the same distribution where we change the reference point to account for the transaction taxes, no bunching. So what is clearly durable is that the number that sticks in your head is the ticket price that you paid for the house in nominal terms of the point that you bought it. And in fact, you know, even casual empiricism would tell you that. So if you ask me what I paid for my house, uh, you know, and I bought it, whatever, 13 years ago, I'll tell you what that number is to the dime today. But if you tell me to gross it up by the time, or, you know, I, and I did pay stamp duty, you know, of course, I remember feeling very bad about the stamp duty, but I couldn't for the life of me remember what that stamp duty grossed up amount is. So I'm just, this is by way of saying that, you know, those adjustments don't really seem to, to stick in people's heads. Now, of course, it, it may be that the information intervention that could be useful is to, is to tell people again and again, look, you know, this is what your house is worth, but, but let's see what that turns up. I think that would be interesting. Tarun, um, mm -hmm. so, okay, I don't want to make your model even more complicated <laughs> since you started talking about different type of bears, mm -hmm. but uh, it, 
could there be a role for the for real estate agents in driving this nominal anchoring? So what I have in mind is, I mean, John Lewis and others, they have this research showing that real agents stand actually much more to gain from, relatively speaking, from lower house price, especially when properties on the market for a long time. And they also know the reference price. Yeah, so yeah. anyway. Um, yes, uh, th this is, a, this is a, a very interesting question. And this has come up uh, uh, before as well. It's something that we've been thinking about. Um, I, I think we do have variation in the data because we are able to see the agent associated with each sale. We can certainly do things by, by conditioning by the, by the agent and, and so on. But I think you're right. The question is really whether the agent is going to try and push you away from your anchor or try to effect a quick sale precisely at the anchor. Uh, and I think some of that is going to depend on the compensation contract of the agent, whether it's, uh, you know, it's a nominal price in, or, or if they have a discount factor that's very high. And so I think you'd have to, to think about that. I think it would make the model more complicated, but in a good way. It would be quite a rich way and a rich addition to the model. So, yeah. Good. And then um, we're at the central bank. I have to ask the last question mm -hmm. about monetary policy. I mean, um, you spoke about tax policy. Yep. So are we off the hook as a central bank? Uh, ab absolutely not. There's definitely a role for monetary policy here. I think what, it, what this is saying is you want to look at the statistic of what fraction of the property is either listed on the market or out there. And you can actually run the hedonic model over the stock of properties, and we've, we've done that uh, in, in the UK, is something that you should absolutely keep in mind when thinking about what the monetary policy instrument should, is doing at any point in time. Because you're going to have either more or lower stimulative effects on the housing market based on that share uh, in this setup. So if lots of people are sitting on losses, inflation is actually going to grease the wheels of the housing market. If very few agents are uh, sitting on losses, uh, then basically you, you're not going to get as much of a bang for your buck. Yeah, okay. Clear. Thank you. Well, I think we should all thank Tarun for this fascinating talk. Um, round of applause, please. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. I appreciate thank it. You. Thanks so much. That was yeah. great. And, uh, well, I want to take the opportunity to um, thank all of you for coming over to Frankfurt and um, um, I think it has still not been decided where is next year's event, but Wilbert will maybe know better, so please come. But really, uh, while Wilbert comes on stage um, for the closing remarks, uh, it was just a pleasure to host all of you here for these two days. I know the, the program was very dense, little breaks and all that, so, uh, but it um, uh, goes without saying that the topic of um, inflation expectations and the consumer service that we run here are very, very important to us. And we are very keen to see that so many more institutions are joining that. And maybe there's even another institution that is joining. So, Wilbert, over to you. But thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Um, so as Jeff mentioned at the beginning of the conference, this is the fifth time we're doing this joint conference on central banks and expectation surveys. And it's, to me, it's really great to see, you know, the quality just gets better every time. And we cover more and more ground as well. It's, you know, the topics we're covering and which is, I think in part, what this is showing is the payoff of huge investments that central banks started to make in these surveys many years ago. And it's really coming to fruition where, you know, we kind of set the agenda still. And it's very exciting that you see central banks leading in an area and being the innovators. And I really think that we are in this area. Um, so again, this conference, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, two excellent keynotes uh, by Tarun and Anna Maria. First time for a policy panel, which I also thought was great fun. A very good idea. And so I think we all learned a lot, and we're looking for next year. Uh, next year, hopefully, it's, uh, everything goes well. It will be in New York again. Uh, so that, that's going to be fun. Uh, so I also want to thank, again, everyone for coming to the conference on behalf of the organizing committee 
Uh, but also I want to especially thank the local, local organizers. I mean, this was fantastic, very well organized conference, beautiful setting, uh, you know, this is really fantastic. So please join me in thanking the local organizers for putting all this together. And, and we're looking forward to seeing you all next year in New York. Yes. If you haven't figured this out yet, <laughs> it's mainly Anna Maria sitting in the back. <laughs>